I've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount, that it is the most radical, fanatical sermon ever preached. It is certainly the most lengthy and complete sermon, one sermon Jesus ever preached. But it shouldn't be radical and fanatical in the sense that we use it. Because while it may not be common in Christianity, what's taught in the Sermon on the Mount, it is normal Christianity. This is what Jesus said, the Sermon on the Mount, all of these teachings. Because remember, this teaching, it says, you know, I'll go back to the scripture I quoted before from Paul to Timothy. This is 2 Timothy 3.16. He says, all scripture is God-breathed. That's what it says, God-breathed. And profitable for, for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. What the Sermon on the Mount is, early on in the public ministry of Jesus, right after he has called his apostles and he's gathered his disciples, what he is doing now with the Sermon on the Mount is training them in righteousness. Righteousness was a free gift to us. We were made right with God the Father as a gift. Jesus Christ, his shed blood on that cross, carried into the Holy of Holies. But we have to walk in that righteousness. We have to live that righteousness. The Sermon on the Mount, from, from Matthew 5, 1 to the end of chapter 7, that is training in righteousness, how we are to live this righteousness. The Sermon on the Mount should be our normal Christianity. It should be, it is the test of whether we are walking in righteousness or not walking in righteousness. It is the test of whether or not there is impurity in our life. And you spoke yesterday and about the people who are drinking and then they become alcoholics. Right. When they first start drinking, their body rejects oh, yeah. because it is a poison. It is a, right. uh, I, yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. I, you know, for, uh, and a really good example is, um, and if you're younger than me, and almost everybody is, mm -hmm. you know, this may not be as understandable, but I, I smoked for years. Mm -hmm. And I started smoking when I was a young teenager. But at the time I started smoking, that was common in our culture. I mean, you know, people weren't saying that smoking was bad. By and large, people were saying that smoking was good, right? And it was really a bad thing. And I can remember, and anybody who smoked should be able to remember this. The first time you picked up a cigarette oh and puffed on it, you had to overcome that. Yes. You had to overcome that because it was horrible. But because of the peer pressure, because of the pressure to fit in, to fit into cool. the culture, you know, you, you overcame, you got past that horror, and you got better at it. Yes. You became you accustomed practiced. to it. You, you practiced. practiced. Yeah. Uh, I have a problem with anybody that shows me a drink, for example, or a food and says, well, you know, you, it's, a, it's a, a, a developed taste. Why did you develop a taste? Hey, if it doesn't taste good the first time, forget about it. Get it out of here. Ching, gone out. Well, the, the problem is, then once you start smoking, oh my goodness, what a hard thing to yeah. get rid of and out of your life. Because that thing that started off hard becomes a part of you. Becomes a part of you and becomes so incredibly difficult to get rid of. That's right. Well, that's true of sin in our lives. Oh when we tolerate sin in our lives and we allow it. You know, when you're first saved and, you know, it's like, oh, man, you just don't want sin in your life. No, everything is. But then maybe you just, you know, start to let a little thing in and tolerate it. Well, you know, everybody, everybody, where everybody's doing this, it's so. And then the next thing you know, you don't even know you're doing it. Well, when you do recognize it, well, everybody's doing it. And it becomes so difficult to deal with. We have to become, uh, let me rephrase this. We live in a world and in a time when one of the great graces is to be tolerant. Tolerant of this and tolerant of that. And one of the great sins in the world, according to the world, is intolerance. That's true. And you know, one of the one of the worst things that people can call you is, well, you're intolerant. I'm intolerant. Because I have the mind of Christ. And may I become intolerant of sin. Totally, completely, and absolutely intolerant of sin in my life. Because if it doesn't start with your own life, if you don't become intolerant of sin in your own life, you have no right to be intolerant of sin in anybody else's life. I promise you that. And anytime you become intolerant of sin in somebody else's life, it better be because you love them 
and your purpose is to help them get away from that addiction that is deadly. But we need to become intolerant because God is intolerant to sin. Six things does the Lord hate, yea, even seven are an abomination. The church has become tolerant of way, way too much sin. We have, we have as much, if not more, divorce within inside, within the church than in the world. In spite of the fact that it is clearly written and should be taught that God hates divorce. Now, I don't sit here in condemnation, for there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But that doesn't mean we're going to tolerate. We want to deal with these things, because God has the power to correct. And he reproves, he disciplines those whom he loves. Okay, so just remember that lukewarm Christians are. Read this and study this in, in Revelation chapter 3. Lukewarm Christians are an impurity in the body of Christ. A defilement of the body of Christ and a danger to the body of Christ. And Jesus will, by design, violently expel them from the body, from his body, regardless of how ugly or uncomfortable it is. His body will be purged. Not a burning, cleansing flame, and send the fire. Your blood-bought gift to.